Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. We start tonight with the India-China competition, not the political or strategic one, but the economic one. The two countries have had contrasting fortunes. While China's economy is struggling, India is flying high. So everyone is asking the obvious question. Will India replace China as the engine of global economic growth? A new report says yes. It also tells us when this could happen. Stay tuned to find out. Meanwhile, Xi Jinping hosted a very important guest this week, a former president of Taiwan. What did the two men discuss and how will it impact Xi's reunification plans? In South Korea, it's election day. President Yoon faces a major test as he seeks parliamentary majority. But in Nepal, people want the opposite, an abolition of the republic and a return to monarchy. Why is, why is that and how will it affect the, the region? In India, election campaigning is on in full swing. The ruling BJP has invited 25 political parties from other countries to observe the Lok Sabha polls. Who got the invite and who did not? We'll tell you. In the US, another fatal blow to abortion rights, a law from 1864 has been reinstated in Arizona. Will Western leaders condemn it? In Europe, Champions League football is on the Islamic State's radar. In South Africa, former President Jacob Zuma is back in the fray for elections. And finally, what is the silliest AI product you can think of? We have a list for you, but first the headlines. Is Israel running out of allies? US President Joe Biden says Prime Minister Netanyahu making a quote-unquote mistake in handling the Gaza war. It's Biden's sternest criticism of Netanyahu. Spain calls Israel's disproportionate response in Gaza a global threat. It happens only in Pakistan. A commercial flight carrying Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif diverted from Islamabad to Lahore to disembark the VIPs. Shabazz Sharif was accompanied by his Defence Minister and Punjab Chief Minister Maryam Nawaz. There were nearly, there are, there were nearly 400 other passengers on board. The profits of TikTok owner ByteDance jumped around 60% in 2023. With this, ByteDance has overtaken its arch rival Tencent. The TikTok creator has grown into one of the world's biggest tech firms. ByteDance is estimated to be worth around $225 billion. Set back for Russia's space program, Moscow cancels its rocket launch for the second consecutive day. The high-profile launch was cancelled just minutes before liftoff over a suspected software glitch. A third attempt will be made on Thursday. And in a first, Olympic gold winners will now receive a cash prize as well. The winners of the Paris Olympics will get $50,000. From the 2028 Olympics, silver and bronze medalists will also rece receive prize money. This is the Asian century. How many times have we been told that? But Asia is not some united entity. It's a massive continent of almost 50 countries. So the Asian age could also be the age of competition. China won the first two decades. It became the engine of global economic growth. But can India win the coming decades? A new report says yes, India can. India could replace China as the driver of global growth. And when could that happen? as soon as 2028. Now, just to be clear, this does not mean that India's GDP will overtake China's in the next four years. It means India's contribution to global growth will be higher than China's in this period. Basically, India will become the growth engine. And what is driving this change? Well, broadly, two factors, China's fall and India's rise, as simple as that. Look at this new report by ratings agency Fitch. They have downgraded their outlook on China. It was stable before. Now it's negative. And why is that? Because debt is rising and growth is slowing. In 2019, China's debt was 38% of its GDP, but now it's almost 50%, 56% rather. And by the end of this year, it could be 61%. At the same time, growth is falling. China grew by just 5.4% last year, and this year the projection is 4.6%. 
So the Chinese economy is losing momentum. Meanwhile, India is gaining it. The Indian economy is projected to grow by 7% this year. And don't forget the political headwinds. Many suppliers are moving out of China. They're scared of crackdowns and sanctions. And India is gaining from this. Just look at Apple. China has long been their top factory. But now Apple is diversifying. They assemble 14% of their iPhones in India. Take seven iPhone models, chances are one of them was made in India. And this output is worth almost $14 billion. So China's loss is India's gain. But you cannot rest on those gains. You must build on them. The same report also mentions two things that India must do. First, continue the infrastructure push. And second, invest in human capital, basically skill and educate the people. The infra push has been a key priority for the Modi government. In this financial year, around $132 billion has been set aside. That's three times the allocation five years ago. And what will this money produce? Roads, highways, railways, airports, seaports, waterways. Things that will multiply economic growth. Better roads equal faster trade. Faster trade equals time saved and time saved is money made. Another factor that works in India's favor is federalism. Indian states love to compete. Sometimes that competition can turn hateful and toxic, but in the long run, it can also help. It pushes each state government to do better than the other. Again, data supports this. Eight Indian states are expected to become trillion dollar economies by 2048. What does that mean? These states will have a GDP of one trillion dollars each. Now, to put that in context, India's current GDP is $3.3 trillion. Now, some states are hoping to touch a trillion on their own. And which are these eight states? Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Karnataka are expected to reach first by around 2040. Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Telangana, and Andhra Pradesh will follow. Of course, this is a projection. It requires consistent and rapid growth to achieve this. But compare it to China. Forget adding to the growth. Local governments are dragging China down. If you add all this together, the takeaway is quite clear. India is poised to replace China, to become the engine of global growth. And I know it sounds great, but it's also important to not be complacent because challenges still remain. One of them is investor confidence, not in the stock market because that's booming, but in Indian startups. A new report says India's unicorn count has dropped. A unicorn is a startup valued at more than $1 billion. Since 2017, India has only added unicorns. But now the opposite is happening. India's unicorn count fell in 2024. The country has only 67 unicorns left. But that's not the most worrying part. More than 130 unicorns were founded by Indians. But they set up these companies outside India. And that should raise questions. Why did they not set up shop in India? Is it the business climate? Is it the regulation? Is it the talent pool? And asking such questions is very important because you cannot take economic projections for granted. You need to assess and tweak as you go. Because one black swan event could change all of it like the Wuhan virus pandemic in 2020. One bad policy could set us back by years. So now is the time to keep your head down and work. Maybe take a leaf out of China's book in the 1970s. Bide your time. Which brings us to China and its decline. Why can't they reverse it? Because their priorities have shifted. And by they, I mean the Chinese leadership, more specifically Xi Jinping. In the 1990s, China was all about reform and opening up. But now with Xi at the helm, territorial battles have taken precedence. It seems they're more important than economic growth for him. Case in point, Taiwan. Beijing wants to take Taiwan. And it's deploying new pressure tactics. Look at what happened today. Xi Jinping met Ma Yingzhu. He was Taiwan's president from 2008 to 2016. Ma traveled to Beijing for this meeting, and it was the first of its kind. Since 1949, since the People's Republic of China was established, no Chinese president has invited a former leader of Taiwan to Beijing. Tells you why this meeting is making waves. So what did they discuss? The reunification of Taiwan. The distance of Taiwan Strait cannot separate the blood and flesh ties of both sides. Differences in our systems cannot change the objective facts that both sides of the Taiwan Strait belong to the same nation. 
the same ethnicity. Foreign interference cannot stop the historic event of a family reunion. He's calling it a family reunion. Xi Jinping was amicable in his tone, but the purpose of this meeting is far from friendly. The Chinese president wants Taiwan to surrender. He wants to send a message to the island that they must agree to reunification or else. And for this purpose, Ma is a useful tool for Beijing. When he was Taiwan's president, he backed the idea of reunification. And even today, he is of the same opinion. He believes that Taiwan will have a better future if it is closely aligned with China. Young people represent the future of the Chinese nation as they are able to establish friendships at an earlier stage of their lives, which will certainly build a solid foundation for the sustainable peace and stability between both sides of the Taiwan Strait. The last meeting between Xi Jinping and Ma Yingzhu was in the year 2015 when Ma was still serving as Taiwan's president. After he left office, Xi Jinping stopped engaging with Taipei. He froze all high-level communication. Now, by bringing Ma to Beijing, he's setting the new terms of engagement. Xi Jinping won't accept anything less than reunification. But there's a slight problem. The people of Taiwan reject this. Leaders like Ma Yingzhu are in the minority. Most Taiwanese citizens want independence from China. They support democratic leaders like Lai ching Te. He's the incoming president of Taiwan. He won the election earlier this year, despite Beijing's best efforts. He won the election. Now, Beijing calls Lai a dangerous separatist. And before he takes oath, China is trying to build pressure on him. Soon after his victory, Beijing has launched... In fact, they launched a campaign with two clear goals. One was to isolate Taiwan and the second to raise the threat of invasion. In January, they succeeded in poaching an ally of Taiwan, the Pacific island of Nauru. They shifted allegiances from Taipei to Beijing. They were one of the few countries that recognized, officially recognized Taiwan. Now they do not do that anymore. Then Chinese airlines started operating civilian flights closer to the island. This is being done without Taipei's consent. And military pressure on Taiwan has also escalated. There is now a large Chinese military presence around Taiwan. In addition to the dispute between the Philippines and China, I think everyone also knows that China has already constructed quite enormous South China Sea military bases on the three islands surrounding Taiping, Subi Reef, Fiery Cross Reef and Mischief Reef, which are all quite close to our Taiping Island. We have to include this situation in our general considerations. A few weeks ago, some satellite pictures emerged. This is a Chinese desert, but the PLA has turned it into a training site. For what? It is believed that China uses this facility to practice for a potential invasion of Taiwan. Now look closely at these satellite pictures. This looks a lot like Taipei, especially the presidential office building in Taipei. Now experts say this mock-up is quite realistic. China has recreated the area around the presidential palace the presidential office rather, including the roads that lead up to it. Why would the PLA need such an elab elaborate setup if they wanted peaceful reuni reunification with Taiwan? The odds are stacked heavily against Beijing in this case, which is why they made a significant shift in March this year, last month. That's when the Chinese parliament met. They dropped the mention of peaceful reunification altogether. Clearly, they're exploring military alternatives and this replica of Taipei inside China signals Xi Jinping's growing appetite for conflict. He may be recruiting friends from the island, but ultimately, he's also setting the stage to attack them. Let's look further east towards South Korea. South Korea held its 22nd general election today. 300 parliamentary seats were on the ballot and millions of Korean citizens turned up to vote. 
More than 14,000 polling stations were set up for the public, including some unusual ones like a Kia car showroom, an optical store and a cafe. In at least one area, a baseball batting cage was converted into a polling booth. South Korea's election commission definitely scored a home run, unlike the president's party. You see, South Korea has a twin-headed system. You have the president and the parliament. And both are elected, the president and the parliament. And they usually cannot work without each other. Which is why this election was crucial for the president, Yoon suk Yeol. Yoon has been in power since the year 2022, but his party has not controlled the parliament which makes him a bit of a lame duck. He wanted to change that with this election and lead his party, the People Power Party, to a majority. But early results indicate that his hold on power will get even shakier. Counting has begun. We'll get the final results tomorrow morning. But the exit polls are in and the opposition is expecting a landslide, which means these people in the blue baseball jackets they are members of the Democratic Party of Korea, seen here clapping and cheering. That banner on display, it says April 10th, Judgment Day for Yoon So Kyol's administration. Which is what this election had become. A referendum on President Yoon's two years in office. And it seems that the voters have decided to punish him. Uh, I think the current government is heading in a very wrong direction. I believe the right people need to be in politics. I think there needs to be some change, some transformation. So why are South Koreans unhappy with their president? Well, there are a number of reasons, but here's a quick list. We start with the Dior scandal involving First Lady Kim Kyun Hee. Hidden camera footage of the First Lady was released last year. She was seen accepting a luxury handbag as a gift. A Lady Dior bag worth about $2,200. And this violated South Korean law. There's a limit to what a government official or their spouse can accept. No gifts worth more than $750 are allowed. So this video caused an uproar when it came out because this gift was worth more than $2,000. But the First Lady was not punished. Excuses for ma were made for her actions. And she has not been making public appearances since. But today's election shows that the people have not forgotten or forgiven. And that wasn't President Yoon's only scandal. Another involved his former defense minister, Lee jong Suk. The minister was under investigation over the death of a soldier during flood rescue efforts last year. Now, this is a sensitive topic. So what President Yoon did last month made no sense whatsoever. The same former defense minister was made South Korea's ambassador to Australia and it caused an uproar. It looked like Yoon was shielding his colleague. The ambassador was then forced to resign in under a month. But the damage was done. That was strike two. And strike three was a foot-in-the-mouth moment for the president himself. Last month, the South Korean president went to a grocery store. He looked at a bunch of spring onions. And then he said that the price was reasonable. And that was the gaffe. You see, the price he quoted was 875 won, that's about 65 cents. And it was reasonable, 65 cents. But only because a temporary, of a temporary government subsidy. This was a heavily discounted price, compared to the average of, of about two to three dollars per bunch. And this led to an outpouring of public anger. People took to the streets with spring onions in their hands. It became a rallying cry, highlighting Yoon's failure to bring down the cost of living. In fact, it got so bad that South Korea even made a new election rule. People were barred from bringing onions into polling booths. But again, the damage was done. It seems onions have brought tears to Yoon and his party. He's staring at a hostile parliament, three more years as a lame duck, and maybe his party losing the presidency when his term ends. So it's a dance of democracy in South Korea, but elsewhere, people are rejecting it. I'm talking about Nepal. On Tuesday, hundreds of protesters hit the streets of Kathmandu. And what did they want? Well, two things. One, to bring the monarchy back. And two, to make Nepal a Hindu state. Now, the turnout was quite impressive. 
in this protest. Protesters waved flags and chanted slogans, but soon things turned violent. Riot police turned up to contain the situation. They used water cannons and batons. Take a look. How about that? Demanding a king in 2024. But what explains these demands? Well, there is context to it. For most of its history, Nepal was a Hindu kingdom. The last king was this man, Gyanendra. He was forced to abdicate after major protests in 2006. After that, two changes happened. The monarchy was replaced by a republic and the new constitution guaranteed secularism. So Nepal is not a Hindu state anymore. But has this change worked? Well, stability has evaded Nepal. They've had 13 governments since the king abdicated. That's 13 governments in 18 years. So the people of Nepal have every reason to be angry. But is monarchy the answer? Mainstream parties do not think so. All of them have rejected this possibility. But one party has not. The same party that is leading this movement. It's called the Rashtriya Prajatantra Party or National Democratic Party. It was founded in the 1990s by supporters of the king. Today, it's the fifth largest in parliament. Out of 275 lawmakers, this party has 14. Now, just to be clear, they're not asking for absolute monarchy. They're not saying cancel elections. They are saying cancel the republic. The prime minister will remain, the cabinet will remain, and so will the parliament. But instead of the president, a king would be head of state. A bit like Britain, that's the demand. Royalists say it will provide stability and protect Nepal's culture. Now, we've already discussed why this is a bad idea. Nepal's polity is already fragile. The last thing you need is a king. And that to a king with a tendency for autocracy. But tonight, let's focus on another aspect. The geopolitical impact of these protests. For example, how should India see this? We're talking about a neighboring country here. India and Nepal share a pretty long border. It's more than 1,850 kilometers long. So instability there is worrying. It could affect trade and people-to-people -people exchanges. The other factor is influence. And there are two camps here. One group says a Hindu Nepal would benefit India. It would stifle the pro-China communists. Another group says it's a slippery slope. If you abolish secularism, there will be global pushback. Maybe even economic sanctions. And that could push Nepal closer to China. After all, Beijing does not care about secularism. So sanctions for that, or sanctions for that matter. So this debate is likely to be a long one. Nepal did try to resolve it once in 2015. Like now, many protesters wanted to abolish secularism, to remove it from the draft constitution, so the Constituent Assembly voted on it. And guess what? Two-thirds of the lawmakers voted against it. The main opposition comes from the communist parties. They have vehemently opposed a Hindu state. But another mainstream party is warming up to the idea, and that's the Nepali Congress. The top leadership still doesn't like the idea. But one faction does. In February, they launched a campaign to restore a Hindu state, and that's the key here. As long as mainstream parties disagree, this movement won't take off. But if they buy in, who knows? Stranger things have happened. Talking about democracy, the world's largest democracy is heading to polls. 986 million Indians will vote soon and observing them will be global parties. India's ruling party has invited 25 of them. 13 have confirmed their presence. They will be given a ringside view of the election. So who's on the list? I'll tell you who's not. The likes of China, Pakistan and the United States. And why is that? Which countries will observe India's polls? What role will they play? And has India ever acted as an election observer in other countries? Our next report tells you. Elections. 
they are the cornerstone of any democracy. But the electoral process is not easy. Its integrity faces many challenges. There are irregularities, fraud and coercion, all to derail free and fair elections. India is heading to polls. It's the world's largest democracy, which makes this the world's largest election. It's a mammoth electoral exercise and it needs observers. India's election body already has poll observers, but now India has invited global parties. India's ruling party, the BJP, has invited 25 global parties. 13 of them have confirmed their visits. Indian elections have had foreign observers in the past. So who's on the list this time? Bangladesh's Awami League, the UK's Conservative and Labour parties, Germany's Christian Democrats and Social Democrats, all major parties of Nepal, Sri Lanka's top political parties. They have all been invited to observe the elections. They will be given a brief, taken to various constituencies and given a ringside view of the electoral process. So who's not invited? No party from Pakistan is on the list. Not surprising given the tensions between the two countries. China's Communist Party has also not been invited. But even top US parties have been left out, both the Republicans and the Democrats. Why? Reports suggest it's because they will be busy with their own presidential elections later this year. Which brings us to the concept of election observers. They observe elections, they provide inputs, they act as impartial witnesses to the electoral process. They may not prevent malpractice, but help report it. Election observers are of two kinds, national and international. Internal observers include polling booth officials, officials from other parties and independent witnesses. Then there are international observers. They judge the legitimacy of a country's election. They look at whether it's free and fair. The concept of international observers is fairly new. Until World War II, it wasn't very common. During the 1960s, less than 10% of elections were monitored. But it gained steam after the Cold War. The East-West divide gave an economic context to democratic elections. Free elections were linked to a free market. So the West set the rules. By the 2000s, about 80% of all elections were observed. Often, countries send their observers. Sometimes it's conducted by international organizations, regional bodies and NGOs. India is no stranger to international observers. It's a role the country has played many times. India has observed elections in many countries like Egypt, Venezuela, Mexico, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, South Africa, Kenya, Cambodia and many others. So this time, India has invited global parties, offering them a front row seat to the dance of democracy, as the world's largest democracy goes to polls. Check your calendar. What does it say? It should say April 2024. But if you live in the United States, it may not. Your calendar may say 1864. And I'll tell you why. The top court in the U.S. state of Arizona has passed a judgment. It has reinstated an abortion ban from 1864. Let me repeat that. A law from 1864 has been reinstated. And what does it say? Abortion should be punishable by two to five years in jail. Only one exception if the mother's life is in danger. What if the mother is a victim of rape or incest? It doesn't matter. Under this law, you still can't get an abortion. It's a near total ban. And how will it be enforced? Well, that's not clear yet. The, government, the court has not ordered an immediate enforcement. They have given 14 days time. Chances are a lot could happen in that time. For starters, Arizona has a Democratic governor and she's promising to fight this verdict. Arizona's 2022 abortion ban is extreme and hurts women. And the near total Civil War era ban that continues to hang over our heads only serves to create more chaos for women and doctors in our state. As governor, I promised I would do everything in my power to protect our reproductive freedoms. There's also a referendum coming up in November. Voters in Arizona can reject abortion bans then. 
But for a moment, forget the technicalities, forget the politics. Think about how absurd this is. 1864 was 160 years ago. Slavery was still legal in the US. Women had no right to vote. Arizona as a state did not even exist. Yet a law from that time is now being imposed. How is this even possible? Because of what happened in 2022, hardliners in Arizona have always wanted to impose this law, but they had a problem. U.S. Supreme Court rulings prevented them. But in 2022, that changed. America's top court overturned its previous abortion verdicts, including the most famous one, Roe v. Wade. So now hardliners had a free pass. They approached the Arizona court once again, and this time the court said, OK. It's a classic case of collective failure from the president to the court to the Congress to state governors. And who suffers for it? The women of America. But you, do, you will not hear the world talking about it. No statement from the United Nations, no special reports by rights bodies. It's all part and parcel of American politics. But actually, it reveals a systemic problem. The West thinks that women's rights is a far off issue, a problem for radical mullahs and brown populists not for the suited lawmakers of America. But clearly that is not the case. American politicians are toying with women's rights. When it suits them, they oppose it. When it doesn't, they support it. Just look at Donald Trump. As president, he packed the Supreme Court with conservative judges. His end goal was to overturn abortion laws and he succeeded. Those same judges reversed Roe versus Wade. But now he's making a U-turn. Trump says he does not support a nationwide abortion ban. Instead, it should be left to the states. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. It's a huge climb down for Donald Trump and other Republicans are following his lead like Carrie Lake. She's running for Senate from Arizona. In the past, she had called for a near total ban on abortion, but now she's changing her tune. She says the court's verdict is wrong. What explains this U-turn? American public opinion. Look at what a poll found last year. Only 13% Americans support banning abortions. 34% say it should always be legal. 51% say it should mostly be legal. So most Americans want to legalize abortion. Hence Donald Trump's U-turn. Surveys show a tight contest between him and Biden, so he needs to win over the moderates. But we say that is the problem. Abortion rights should not depend on public opinion. They should depend on election cycles. They should be constitutionally guaranteed. If not, pressure must be built. We saw French President Emmanuel Macron rally for abortion rights this year. He enshrined it in the French Constitution. Will the same Macron also criticize this Arizona verdict? Will he call out Joe Biden's inaction? In fact, I could ask the same question to all Western capitals. They love to meddle in internal affairs of other countries. Well, here's the perfect chance, we say. You have a major human rights crisis in the United States. How many of them will speak up now? You're waiting to find out. Meanwhile, there is a new terror threat in Europe. It comes from the ISIS or the Islamic State. Their target is football, specifically the Champions League. It is Europe's biggest football competition and it's on as we speak. The tournament has entered the quarterfinal stage. Four important matches are being played this week in three different cities. London and Paris are hosting one game each and the third host is Madrid. Two games will be played in Madrid. Now the ISIS has threatened to strike all four venues. The threat was issued online. The games feature marquee teams like Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Manchester City, Arsenal and Bayern Munich. So the stadiums will be packed. Thousands of fans will show up to support their teams which makes these matches high profile targets. The warning from ISIS came on Monday. It was a social media post featuring the four venues where the games will be held. The post also had a picture of a man with a gun with the words, kill them all. But the organizers are undeterred. That's UEFA, the organizers, the Union of European Football Associations. They've decided that they will not cancel the games. All three cities have stepped up security. The French interior minister has spoken about it. 
We have seen, among others, a statement from the Islamic State which is particularly targeting stadiums. This is nothing new. Obviously, when it comes to important events like the Champions League for football, we have a discussion with our partners. This morning, we asked the General Director of Interior Security to communicate the information we have with other security services of the countries hosting the quarterfinals. For the game that will take place in Paris, the Prefect of Police, with whom I spoke very early this morning, has considerably reinforced the security resources. The French in particular are vigilant because they've seen an attack in the past. Nine years ago, ISIS suicide bombers attacked a football game in France. It happened during a friendly match. France was playing Germany at Start de France. The then president, Francois Hollande, was among the attendees. He was watching the game when the bombs went off. A total of three bombs were detonated. Two explosions happened outside the stadium. The attackers arrived at different entrances wearing suicide vests. The third one blew himself up at a fast food joint close to the stadium. And this was just the beginning. Soon after these explosions, ISIS terrorists went on a shooting spree in Paris. They targeted a concert hall and multiple restaurants and bars. More than 130 people died that night. Now, once again, the ISIS is back and it's threatening to strike high profile targets again. Last month's attack has probably emboldened the group. Yes, I'm talking about the Moscow attack. In the month of March, they struck a concert hall near Moscow. Terrorists stormed the venue with automatic weapons. At least 60 people were killed. This was Russia's deadliest attack in decades. Islamic State Khorasan claimed responsibility for it. This is an ISIS affiliate based in Afghanistan. The attack in Russia underscored how tricky it is to deal with such threats. The ISIS has no centralized structure or command. It operates through faceless entities. Its members use the internet to recruit lone wolves and they order strikes. So the next attack could come from anywhere. Just this week, the Americans said they neutralized one such threat. An 18-year-old was arrested in Idaho. His name is Alexander Mercurio. Reports say he had pledged loyalty to ISIS and he was planning to strike a number of churches in the U.S. using weapons like guns, explosives and knives. And that's, that puts the U.S., Russia and Europe in the same bracket, really, struggling to contain the ISIS and equally vulnerable. We do hope the matches in Europe conclude without incident. Our next story comes from Venezuela, a country in South America with a reputation for being one of the most corrupt nations in the world. But contrary to nature, its government is cracking down on embezzlement. Since last year, a number of top officials have been pulled up for allegedly siphoning off billions of dollars in oil proceeds. There have been investigations, resignations and now a major arrest. The country's former oil minister and confidant of President Nicolas Maduro has been arrested. So what's behind the purge? And will the presidential election schedule for July, with the election schedule for July, does the timing have a role to play here? Our next report tells you. This is Tarek El Aysami, Venezuela's former oil minister, a once powerful oil czar and confidant of President Nicolas Maduro. Over time, El Aysami has fallen from grace and now he's in handcuffs. El Aysami was arrested over allegations of corruption. And he's not the only one. Former Finance Minister Simon Zerpa and businessman Samark Lopez have been arrested as well. El Ministerio Público. The public ministry in the next few hours will charge these three detainees with the crimes of treason, appropriation or distraction of public property flaunting of relationships and influence, and money laundering and association. A plurality of crimes that will culminate in an exemplary punishment for these scoundrels. Their arrests are part of a wider government purge. There are charges against more than 50 people, including Venezuela's most important business and political figures. Why? For their role in an alleged plot to make hundreds of millions of dollars in oil proceeds disappear. Here's what happened. According to the nation's top prosecutor, former oil minister El Aysami and his co-conspirators were selling Venezuelan oil. They signed contracts with the state oil major, loaded the crude on ships and sold the oil. But not all payments were made to the oil company. 
because the former ministers didn't pass the funds to the country's central bank. They directly managed the shipments of crude. Plus, they received dividends from the sale and traded these sums of money to convert them to crypto assets, which regulatory bodies could not trace. The Venezuelan big guns reportedly misused their positions to carry out these illegal operations and made huge profits. El Aysami reportedly used the illicit funds to work on his private houses. Some used it to fund their political campaigns. But just how much money was going around? The government has not declared the exact sum, but reports say as of 2022, the state oil company was owed tens of billions of dollars which left a large hole in its accounts. So an investigation began in March last year, and it shook Venezuela. Amid a slew of charges, El Aysami resigned from his position. And now, a year later, he has been arrested. It's a remarkable reversal of fortune for one of Venezuela's most powerful men. Corruption is rampant in Venezuela. The South American nation is considered one of the most corrupt in the world. That's according to the Corruption Perception Index. So why are corrupt leaders suddenly in trouble? The timing is crucial. President Maduro is running for re-election in July this year. So is this an image cleanup exercise for him? Or have his aides simply fallen out of favor? And the big question is, will the probe uncover the slime or will it be an eyewash? Our next story is from South Africa. It's heading into an election and it just got more unpredictable. Former President Jacob Zuma is back in the running. He has a new party. He's got the go-ahead from courts and he's ready to take revenge. The ruling ANC, the African National Congress, should watch out. Because Zuma is a wild card who could end their three decades in power. Tonight we'll discuss how. South Africa goes to polls on May 29th. It will be the closest fought election in decades. For the first time since 1994, the ANC is under threat. They haven't been challenged for decades because of the goodwill generated by Nelson Mandela. Mandela was an ALC, ANC stalwart. He fought against the tyranny of apartheid, the institutionalized racism that was prevalent in South Africa before 1994. He fought against it. Mandela's African National Congress helped end apartheid. And as a reward, the party has been power ever since, for 30 years now. They've held on to power. But their hold is now slipping. The ANC is facing pressure this time. South Africans are angry at poor economic growth, widespread corruption, a failure of public services and rising crime. And they blame the ANC for all of this. So for the first time, the party may not win an absolute majority. Opinion polls say they will get less than 50% of the vote. So they're scrambling to retain power. What makes their situation worse is Jacob Zuma. Zuma was an ANC member. The party even made him president. Between 2009 and 2018, he was the South African president, but numerous corruption scandals piled up under him. Zuma was close to an Indian origin business family, the Guptas. Zuma allegedly let them take over the running of South Africa. It was called state capture. In fact, Zuma was even nicknamed Zupta because of his ties to the Guptas. The scandal led to his downfall and his resignation in 2018. The ANC replaced Zuma with the current president, that's Cyril Ramaphosa, his longtime rival. And adding insult to injury, Zuma is also being investigated in a number of corruption cases. So far, he's not been convicted in any of these crimes. Despite this, he was sentenced to 15 months in prison for contempt of court. In 2021, Zuma had refused to cooperate with an ongoing corruption probe. He was sentenced to 15 months in prison for this defiance. So to recap, Jacob Zuma was ousted from power, replaced by a rival, investigated for corruption, and sent to prison for contempt. You can see why he would want revenge. Zuma has joined a new political party, the MK Party, and he has vowed to take down Ramaphosa's government. And this has shaken the ruling ANC because Zuma still holds a lot of clout in South Africa. He's 81 years old, 82 on Friday. 
He is accused in a number of corruption cases and he has broken with the party that helped him to power. Despite all of this, he is still quite popular. He is a charismatic politician, still capable of bringing in the crowds and getting them to their feet. With his trademark song, a revolutionary song called Bring My Machine. It's rare to see an 81-year-old dance like that. Can you imagine Joe Biden doing that, even though he's the same age? But somehow, Jacob Zuma manages, and it helps him win over some hearts. Zuma commands the loyalty of a large section of voters, especially people from his Zulu community. They make up a large part of South Africa's electorate, meaning he could siphon votes from the ANC. How many votes? Zuma's party is expected to win 10 to 15 percent of the total vote share, and most of this would be at the ANC's expense, almost ensuring that the ruling party does not win a majority. Which is why the ANC seems to be targeting Zuma. They've tried to, to have his new party, MK Party, disqualified. They raised objections to him standing for the election. He was even barred for a while, but yesterday the objections were overturned and Zuma won his appeal. So he will contest the election in May. And this entire episode could even work, work out in his favor, get him some extra sympathy votes. Now, Zuma is not eligible to become president again because he's already served the two-term limit. But he could very well become South Africa's kingmaker. And if that happens, President Cyril, Cyril Ramaphosa is in trouble because his old rival Jacob Zuma may end up having the last laugh. For our next story, let's turn to AI, artificial intelligence. It holds a lot of promise. AI has improved cancer screenings, written code for apps, even trained itself. The technology is helping the world in momentous ways. But this is not without some quirks. With great offerings, also come silly ones, like AI in shoes, in pillows, even toothbrushes. Here's a report. Whenever new technology comes up, we get excited. We rush to try new tech. Some of these new tech ideas are good, but there are also some bizarre ideas in the mix. This applies to artificial intelligence as well. Pardon the pun, but tooth be told, things are getting a little too weird. Because this is AI's recent offering. A toothbrush. It costs $400. What does it do? It has a quote-unquote AI position detection, which is basically tech jargon for sensors that detect which tooth you're brushing. The human body already has these sensors. They're called nerves. But back to AI. There is a screen on the toothbrush. It tells you if you're brushing with the proper level of strength. The information reflects on an app on your phone as well, which shows a 3D image of your teeth and collects this information. Now, if you want daily grades for your brushing, maybe this sounds like a great product. But this isn't the only silly route that AI has taken. There are AI pillows as well. They detect snoring, then pump air into different pillow compartments to gently lift the head. This alleviates a person's snoring without their partner having to kick them in the middle of the night. Then there are AI vacuum cleaners, AI washing machines, even AI bird feeders. These cost $100 and detect birds. Too bad they won't help with thievish squirrels. And if you don't want to walk, AI can do that as well. There are AI-powered electric shoes. They function like any other shoe, but they cost $1,000 because they automate walking. With one slight movement, you can speed up or slow down walking. So you wear the shoes as the overuse of technology wears your body down. But apart from strange AI offerings, there are some that have been a complete flop. And we aren't saying this, Amazon is. It launched cashierless grocery stores where you grab products from store shelves. AI detects what you have picked through constant monitoring from sensors and cameras and automatically charges you for it. So you don't need to scan the items or pay at the register. It sounds seamless, but problems occur when the AI software charges you for something you haven't picked. 
which is exactly what happened. Now Amazon has admitted that the tech has been a flop. So some AI offerings have completely failed. But even some successful ones have joined forces to waste time. Like McDonald's and FedEx asking job applicants to take personality evaluations and then get mandatory AI personas based on the results. Or the New York mayoral office using an AI chatbot that is malfunctioning repeatedly. With AI mania looming large, companies are racing to meet the frenzy to stay current and prove to their stakeholders that they can keep up. This is great because AI does have its benefits. But the problem is that it can also suck your time, energy, money and most importantly, your data. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Jerusalem, thousands offer Eid prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque amid the Gaza war. In Indonesia, millions brave mass traffic jams to head back home for Eid. And a volcano in Ireland continues to spew lava and smoke since its eruption last month. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day. In 1912, the Titanic set sail from England. It was on its maiden voyage to New York. At that time, it was the world's largest ship. Within a few days, the luxury liner hit an iceberg and sunk, killing 1,500 passengers on board. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. سمع الله لمن حمل لك الحمد والنجم والشجر Risky, volatile and unpredictable. These are some terms often used to define the stock market, a place where people buy and sell stocks of publicly traded companies. While investing in the stock market can be lucrative, it comes with various risks. One of them is the time it takes to complete a transaction in the stock market. On average, a stock market transaction takes at least three days to complete. And this has been a legacy issue for stock markets the world over. Now, India has taken the first step to change this. On March 28, the stock markets in India created history. BSE or the erstwhile Bombay Stock Exchange and NSE or the National Stock Exchange rolled out a new system. They became the world's first to introduce a single-day trade settlement cycle. But what is a trade settlement cycle? And why is this a big deal? To understand that, let's first look at how stock market transactions work.
Shares of publicly listed companies are traded on different stock exchanges around the world, such as the New York Stock Exchange in the US or the BSE in India. An investor first places the order for shares via a stock broker or an online trading app. The order is then transferred to a stock exchange where it's matched with stocks being sold by other investors. Once the order is matched, the stock is credited to the buyer's account, while the money is transferred to the seller's account. And following the money transfer, the trade is considered complete. This process is known as the trade settlement cycle. Earlier, it used to take multiple days to complete this cycle. Stock exchanges use terms like T plus 1, T plus 2, T plus 3 and so on to denote the number of days it takes to complete a trade. Here, T stands for the day a trade order is placed and the numerical part represents the number of extra days it may take to complete the transaction. For example, if a stock exchange uses the T plus 2 trade settlement cycle, it will take at least three days to complete a share transaction one day for the order and two more days for the transfer process. Now, under India's new process, the trade settlement cycle will be completed in just one day. This cycle is also known as T plus zero settlement, where T stands for the day the trade order is placed and zero signifies that it won't take any additional days to settle the cycle. As of now, most stock markets worldwide operate on a T plus 2 settlement cycle, meaning once an order is placed, it takes three days to complete the transaction. But India has always been at the forefront of resolving this issue. Indian authorities have gradually decreased the trading time frame. Before 2001, it used to take over six days to trade a share in India. In 2003, this was reduced to three days. In 2021, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, or SEBI, which is the country's stock market regulator, introduced a T plus 1 or a two-day settlement cycle. This was introduced for a few shares on a trial basis. And from January 2023, this was applied for all the trading stocks. India was the first country in the world to do this. And now India again leads the world in rolling out same-day settlement cycle. Over the last four or five years, a large number of changes that have been brought about by SEBI, the number of regulations that we have brought into this space is fairly large. Now look what has happened. The market is just blooming and growing and growing because it's now built on such solid foundations. The investor has faith in the ecosystem. The regulator has faith in the ecosystem. Systemic risk has been largely eliminated. The process is currently being tested. 25 shares have been allowed to trade on the single-day settlement cycle, that too, on an optional basis. This means that the investor has the option to pick the cycle favourable to them. They can either choose to trade using the new single-day settlement cycle or continue using the existing two-day settlement. The company shares that are allowed to trade under the new format include Nestle India, Tata Communications, Sipla, Bajaj Auto and more. After the six-month test phase, SEBI is expected to assess the feedback from market participants and decide on the next phase of implementation of the cycle. Meanwhile, around the world, most countries still use a three-day settlement cycle. This includes the US, the UK and the European Union. The US is planning to shift to a two-day settlement cycle on May 28th this year. The European Union, on the other hand, is still observing the impact of shorter trading timelines. In China, stock exchanges offer a mixed settlement cycle, where the share is transferred on the day of the trade, however, the money settlement takes two days. Market analysts believe that a shorter time frame for the transactions will help smaller traders. In the current scenario, the stock transfer process takes a long time. During this, investors have to wait to settle their balances. This creates a liquidity shortage for them, especially those who trade with small capital. Hence, a shorter settlement cycle is expected to allow small investors to avail of funds in a single day. Investment returns on the stock market of a country often reflect its economic growth. While the world is facing a risk of economic slowdown, India has consistently reported better than expected growth, and that has boosted its stock market returns. Last year, Indian stock exchanges provided better returns compared to the US and China. 
Meanwhile, the number of market participants has also been rising in India. And now, by reducing the trade settlement cycle to a single day, it's looking forward to exponential growth. India is already one of the top performers among emerging markets. And this new system will further propel its position in the global economy. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol.